Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to read just one verse this morning. Well, maybe two. Uh, well, we're going to read Romans chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. And the Bible says this, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And I was reading that this past week, and I'm still studying it out, but uh, that phrase there in verse 21 really caught my attention, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. So those, the two reign, reigns there, uh, just the fact that before salvation, sin reigned in our life. It was king of our life, sin. And it was ruling in our life, and it had an ultimate destination. It was death. And uh, that as sin was reigning in our life, it hath reigned in our life unto death. That's where it was leading us. But even so, my grace reigned through righteousness. And the only way to have to kick that uh, king out, if you want to call it like that, the only way to kick sin out and to kick sin off of the throne of our life is by righteousness. But the Bible tells us in Isaiah that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so it couldn't be our righteousness, it can't be our righteousness, and it can't be the world's righteousness. And the Bible tells us in Romans 3 that, that, that God has declared his righteousness, which is his son, Jesus Christ. And so if we're going to have grace reign in our life, it can only come through righteousness. We need God's righteousness in our lives. Uh, so if you're saved here this morning... Praise God, sin does not have to reign in your life anymore. If it reigns in your life, if we can say it like this, you have chosen to put sin on the throne of your life. But God, if you're saved, he says you have his righteousness. Therefore, grace can reign supreme in your life. His grace reigning in your life unto eternal life. And so just praise God for that. We know, we know that there's, sin has consequence both temporal and eternal. But we also know this in like fashion. Grace has blessing both temporal and eternal. And so I pray this morning that uh, as you, if you're saved here this morning, that you have the righteousness of God in your life and that his grace would reign in your life. That's a choice that you and I get to make. And I pray we'll make the right choice this morning. Uh, right before we pray, uh, if we could keep some, uh, some people in our prayers, um, keep uh, uh, Brother Tom Downey's brother in your, in your prayers, please. Paul, uh, he's having some health issues and uh, they're not sure exactly what's, what needs to be done and uh, so uh, how to help him. Uh, and so please be in prayer for Brother Tom Downey's brother, Paul. I know that he would appreciate that. And then also, please keep a brother uh, and Mrs. Simonian's son, Michael, in your prayers. Uh, he did have uh, a lump in his back, and we know that he also broke one of the vertebrae in his back. They took the lump out, and they fused his spine, and they did find that the lump was cancerous, but they're still going through the process of trying to figure out uh, whether or not, he, what treatment he needs, if he needs anything like that. That's the last that I've heard about them, so I know that they would greatly appreciate our prayers as well. So let's go to the throne of grace this morning as we begin our services. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. We thank you, dear Father, that through your righteousness and through your strength, you have removed sin from the throne of our life. And now, dear Father, grace is desired to be on the throne of our life through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you give us the opportunity through the power uh, of Jesus Christ and through the choice of our will to allow grace to reign in our life. And I pray to God that if there's anyone here today that has been suffering the consequences of sin because they are not saved, Lord, help them to understand that through your son, through your declared righteousness, they could have the grace of God in their lives reigning and ruling supreme if they would just make the choice to accept Christ as their savior. And Father, here this morning for the Christians, I pray to God that as we have looked at this, I pray that you would help us to choose every day to allow the grace of Christ to rule in our lives, that we may experience the blessings of your grace, both temporally and eternally. And Father, we want to pray this morning for those that we made mention of here just a few moments ago. We pray that you would be with these men's health. We pray for Paul. We pray for the Simonian sons. 
uh, son Michael, dear father, as he is going through the health problems that he has, we pray to God that you would work in both of these situations. We pray to God that if any of them or anyone in the family that doesn't know Christ, would that you would use this as a tool in your hand to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I pray to God that you'd give the doctors wisdom in both cases. I pray to God that you'd give healing as only you can. And I pray also this morning, dear Father, that you'd be with us this morning. Thank you for your grace. Help us to sing, sing and uh, sing with full hearts because of what you have done for us and the love you've demonstrated for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Very excited to see you here this morning. Glad you made it. Glad you braved the cold. We're going to get started with our first song. If you take your song uh, paper there, the first page, One Day is the song. Sing it out nice and loud. It'll warm you up. And if nothing else, just think about that day. There won't be any winter that day. No more seven degree mornings for me. Let's sing it out nice and loud on the first. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, one day they led him up Calvary's mountain, one day they nailed him to die on the tree, suffering anguish, despised and rejected, Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is He. Living He loved me, dying He saved me. Buried He carried my sins far away. Rising He justified freely forever. One day He's coming, oh glory. Day. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Living he loved me. Dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved ones bringing. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Amen. Great singing this morning. That's a wonderful song. Let's flip over. Uh, you don't have to flip, I flip. Page six, I sing the mighty power of God. You get used to saying things. Flip over in your songbook. Page six, if you're at home, the other side of your paper, if you're here in the church, I sing the mighty power of God on the first. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise. 
that spread the flowing seas abroad and filled the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed wherever I turn my eye. If I survey the ground, tread or gaze upon the sky. There's not a plant or flower below, but makes thy glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. While all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy care. And everywhere that man can be, thou God art present there. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you for that. One last time this morning, hymn number 500 on the back side of your paper there. I will sing the wondrous story. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Singing great this morning. Let's keep it up one last time on the first. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. 
Sing it, pep, his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. I was bruised, but Jesus healed me. Faint was I from many a fall. Sight was gone, and fears possessed me, but he freed me from them all. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. Then he'll bear me safely over when my journey is complete. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. Amen. Great singing this morning. <clears throat> oh, yes. Thank you. Well, praise the Lord. I appreciate you singing that. And thank you, Mrs. Ross, again for that special and for playing for us today. Uh, we'd like to uh, just very quickly. <clears throat> uh, that song in our hymnal is usually there's an echo for some of that chorus. And I miss that uh, in that hymnal. So one of these times we'll probably just get it print it off and we'll do the echo too because I really miss doing that echo on that song uh, but we appreciate that. Turn in your Bibles with me very quickly to Exodus chapter 2. While you turn there I'd like to let you know that next week, next Sunday, we're going to try a little experiment with a new live stream service. It's going to be a trial uh, it's going to be a free trial for the church, but we're going to see if we can do something a little differently. So just so you're aware of that, for those of you that are watching online with us, if you're not going to be able to be here with us next week, we are going to try to do that. Uh, and so that'll be starting next Sunday morning, and we'll see how it goes. We'll see if we'll like it. If we don't like it, then we'll go back to the drawing board, and we'll see if something else works. But just so you're aware of that, uh, we're going to do a new live streaming service, give it a trial, and see if we like what happens. So... Uh, we'll appreciate feedback uh, from you uh, if you watch it uh, live or if you watch it later uh, to let us know what you think of it as well. We appreciate that very much. Exodus 2, as you stand with me, please, for the reading of the Word of God. We'll begin reading in verse 11. We'll read down to verse number 22. Exodus 2, verse 11 through 22. <clears throat> the Bible says this. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens. And he spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killedst the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. 
But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to rule their father, he said, How is it that ye are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us, and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, And where is he? Why is it that ye have left the man? Call him, that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter, and she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a strange land. Would you please pray, pray with me this morning? Father, we come before you today, and we are so grateful for the opportunity to be in your house. I thank you for those who are here physically. I thank you for those who are watching live and those who may watch in the days or weeks to come. I pray to God that as we look at your word this morning, that you would speak to our hearts. I pray to God that you would help us to lay aside any distraction. I pray to Father that you would help us to lay aside any frustration or turmoil in our hearts. Help us to, uh, in the next few moments, not during prayer time, but help us to turn off our cell phones if necessary to prevent us from being distracted. And I pray to God that you would just help capture our attention for these few moments this morning. I pray to God that you would, that you would allow your Holy Spirit to work in our midst, that we'd be sensitive to His leading, and that we would obey in how ever and whatever sense you would speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. <clears throat> Albert Einstein was traveling from Princeton on a train. When the conductor came down the aisle punching tickets, Einstein reached in his vest pocket and he could not find his ticket. So he reached into his trouser pockets and his ticket wasn't there either. And he looked in his briefcase, but briefcase and it still... It was not there. He couldn't find it. He looked in the seat next to him, and it still was not there. The conductor kindly said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. And the conductor kept going, and he kept punching tickets. And as he was getting ready to exit that car and go into the next car, he turned and he looked, and he saw uh, Dr. Einstein down on his hands and knees, looking underneath the seat, still searching for his ticket. And so the conductor comes back and says, Dr. Einstein, please don't worry about it. I know who you are. No, there's no problem. You don't need a ticket. And Dr. Einstein said, young man, I know who I am as well. What I don't know is where I'm going. <laughs> and so I like that simple illustration just to remind us how important it is to know the will of God for our lives. If we don't know the will of God for our lives, we really don't know where we're going. We don't know where God would have us to go. Until you know what God's will is for your life, you don't know where you're going. And most of the world does not know what God's will is for their lives. And as a result, they are wandering aimlessly through life, wandering without purpose, direction, and many of them without any hope. Knowing God's will is important. It's vitally important for the believer's life. It's vitally important for any person's life. But just as Important as knowing what God's will is for your life is living out God's will in your life. Uh, you can know what God's will is for your life and you can try to live God's will your own way. And as we look at our text here this morning, I believe that's what Moses was doing. He knew what God's will was. He knew what God's promise was. He had been uh, raised and nurtured by his mother for the first few years of his life. If you look at the culture of the Israelites and the Egyptians in that time, they were nursed. Those children were nursed until they were three or four years old. And so he had grown up and uh, he had just those few years been lovingly taught by his mother, but he had also grown up in Egypt and he had this uh, kinship and kindred with the Israelite people. And I'm sure he had heard the accounts and I'm sure he had heard the stories of God's promise to the people of Israel. But he tried to live and tried to perform God's will his own way. We must be careful not to try and live God's will for our lives our own way. Uh, I know it's God's will for my life to be a husband, because I'm a husband. But I'm sure my wife could probably attest, and I know I certainly can. There have been times where I've tried to live God's will for my life as a husband my way. I know, as God has blessed us with children, that it's God's will for me to be a father. But there have been times where I've tried to be a father 
my own way. I know that uh, as I am the child and the sibling, uh, a child and a sibling, I know that I'm supposed to be a child to my parents and a sibling to my brother, but in both of those cases, I know there have been times where I tried to be those things my own way. I know as God has called me to be a pastor, as God has called me to serve Him in the ministry, I know that in my service to Him, there have been times where I've served, tried to do His will my way. Does that make sense to us here this morning? Pray that you're all with that and the understanding of that. And that's where I believe Moses was. So what happens when we try to do God's will our own way? We often try to live the life God wants us to live in our own strength. And we soon discover that we're not strong enough to live that life. We often try to address the issues of life by our own wisdom. And we soon discover we're not wise enough to handle the smallest problems, let alone the big issues of life. We often try to see God's will accomplished at the wrong time when we try to live God's will our own way. And I believe that's, again, something that we can see with Moses. He knew God would have them to go into the promised land. He knew that God would have them to escape bondage, but he tried to bring it to pass outside of God's time, and he tried to bring it to pass outside of God's method and scope. This morning, as we look at our text, really, we're just going to really focus on verses 11 through 14. Verses 11 through 14, and then we'll, um, and a little bit of 15, and then we'll, we'll really pick up next week, by God's grace, the rest of what we just read in verses 16 through 22. But there's too much contained in these few verses to just simply quickly overlook them or quickly go over them. And so I pray that you'll be with, bear with me this morning. Uh, I'm excited about this passage, and I'm so grateful to have a, a series that we're going through verse by verse and chapter by chapter. It's such a blessing, and it's so needed for our lives. And uh, I pray that as you pay attention this morning, that God will speak to your heart. So again, Moses is trying to live God's will his way. In verse 11, we see that Moses sees the need. He's grown up. He went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren. He looked this way and that way, and when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So Moses sees the need. He sees the need and he is burdened by it. He, he most certainly knew again of God's plan for them to escape bondage and to go into the promised land. He knows they cannot fulfill that unless God delivers them from bondage. So Moses kills the Egyptian. Now, many of us might look at that, and again, I, I believe many of us are familiar with this text, but uh, many of us might read that and say, well, why in the world did he kill him? What was the purpose of it? What was he desiring to be known by this action. Well, praise God, the Bible tells us. The Bible gives us the commentary on this very passage over in Acts 7. So if you'll turn with me quickly to Acts 7, hold your place in Exodus 2. We'll be right back there. But in Exodus, or excuse me, in Acts 7, verses 23 through 25, it says this. Acts 7, verses 23 through 25. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. So let's go back to Exodus, uh, Exodus 2 and let's continue on from here. What the Bible just told us, what God just told us through His inspired commentary on, on Exodus 2 was this. Moses had it come in his heart to go and visit his brethren. When he was out there, he saw that one of his brethren was being, uh, was being abused, and so he avenged him and he killed him, supposing that the children of Israel would understand his intent in killing the Egyptian. He supposed that they would understand his intention that he was to be the one to deliver them, that he wanted to be the one to lead them, that he wanted to be the one that God would use to deliver them from bondage. Are, are you catching that? That's God's commentary on Exodus 2. He wanted them to understand his intention, his actions, without saying a word. How many times do we get in trouble by just doing something and supposing somebody's going to understand why we did it? And we'll get to that here in just a moment. But he hopes 
that the Jews would understand and interpret his meaning for killing the Egyptian. He may have, now we see here in Exodus, excuse me, we see in Exodus, yes, Exodus chapter 2 here, that he looked this way and that way when he saw no man. But we see the intent of his heart. So that tells us one of two things. Either he avenged the man that was being abused in front of the man that was being abused, just thinking he'll spread the word. <laughs> and everybody will come to understand that I'm here to deliver them. Or he's, he was purposing to use this action later, perhaps in a motivating speech, uh, to reveal what he had done. Because the Bible tells us what the intent of his heart was, supposing that they would understand that God would deliver them by his hand. So, it has to be one or the other, doesn't it? Either he avenged this man and killed the Egyptian in front of the man who was being abused, or he did it in such a fashion that maybe he would use it later, or maybe they would discover the body. Here's a third option. They would discover the body and say, oh, somebody killed an Egyptian. The deliverer must be here. One of those three, okay? It's one of those three. He intended that they would understand, though, he was to be the one to deliver them. That's what God tells us. But he could not expect the Jews to interpret what he needed or what he intended if no one knew. Somebody had to have known in some way. So Moses saw the need. He had a burden. He was zealous to be used of God. He wanted to be used of God to deliver his people. So the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, verse 24, by faith he refused to be called the son of Sarah's, uh, Pharaoh's daughter. By faith he chose to be counted among his brethren, Hebrews 11, 25. And by faith he knew that God, what God had for him was far better than what Egypt had to offer in Hebrews 11, verses 25 and 26. He's, moved, he's living by faith, and he knows God's will for the nation. And he may even know God's will for his own life at this point. God wants him to use him. God wants to use him to deliver them. It's possible that he knew that right here based upon his actions and based upon the commentary in Acts 7, verses 23 through 25. It's possible. It's possible. But we'd also want to know this. He allowed his zeal to get ahead of God's plan. He killed this Egyptian ahead of God's plan. He knew that God wanted to what God wanted to do and what he had promised to do. But again, he knew it was impossible to leave Egypt because they're under bondage. So let's help God with his plan. Let's help God in his timing. So I believe, this is my opinion, you can disagree with it if you'd like, and we can still have fellowship together. I believe Moses probably did know that God wanted to use him. I believe that based upon Acts chapter 7. But he didn't know how and he didn't know when. And Moses is trying to do God's will. He tried to do God's will in his own way, though. And as a result, he tried to bring God's will about outside of God's timing. He tried to bring God's will about outside of God's methods. And we could understand this. The ends don't always justify the means. As a result, he tried to bring God's will about in his own wisdom. And all of this is going to backfire on him. But he had a pretty good day, at least in his mind. So, they'll understand my intentions. In verses 13 and 14, he kills them. Acts 7 tells us that he, what the intents of his heart was. So imagine this with me. Let's try to get into Moses' mind here just a little bit. Moses, in his mind... He has demonstrated that he is against the Egyptians. Even though he had been brought up with the Egyptians, he'd been brought up in Pharaoh's household, he had been uh, raised to be a wise man, a, a, a sophisticated man, an Egyptian man. He's as smart as anybody, as any Egyptian could ever be. And so as he now has demonstrated, at least in his mind by his actions, that he's against the Egyptians, now in his mind all he has to do is rally the Jews behind him. That's all he has to do. He has to get them behind him. He has to get them to follow him. And he is expecting that the people would interpret his actions as he intended. He tries to show himself as a healer and leader to the people. And he's, what greater way to do that than the grassroots? Let's start small. Let's go door to door. <laughs> let's, let's start small. Let's look at the problems and let's 
fix some small problems that will get some people to understand what we're trying to do and more people will rally behind me and then we'll get a larger support group and larger support group. It sounds just like what people do today, isn't it? And so he goes to these two men. He goes out the next day. He sees two brethren fighting against each other and one is in the wrong and he's smiting the other one. So Moses says, you're wrong. You need to stop that. You're brethren. You should be getting along together. You shouldn't be fighting against each other. Now, he hopes to get them to agree, to see the wrong, and to what? Thank him? That's really what I think he's expecting, don't you? If you look at this text, he's trying to help them. He says, you're wrong, guy. You shouldn't be doing this to your brother. Now, when he thought that the Jews would accept him for what he did and see him as God's leader, they reject him. They don't see him as their leader or God's work or God's hand of deliverance for them. All they see is a man who's intruding and a murderer. That's all they see. If you're going to try... To live God's will your own way, don't be surprised. You ready? Don't be surprised if and when people don't understand what you're doing. If you're going to try to live God's will out for your life your own way, don't be surprised when and if people don't understand what you're doing. Especially if you don't explain what you're trying to do. Moses thought his actions would explain his intentions. But God commands us to live, God does command us to live by example, does he not? We see in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, he's talking to his disciples. He says, ye are the light of the world. And so don't hide your light. Be an example to the world. He tells them, you're salt. Don't, if, but if the salt has lost its savor, then it's good for nothing. He tells fathers to not provoke their children to wrath in Ephesians 6, verse 4. And I believe what that is talking about is, is telling children, do as I say, not as I do. That's provoking to wrath. Don't expect people to understand your intentions if you never explain why you're doing what you're doing. God commands us over and over again to explain why we do what we do. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. I'm going to read this to you. Please write them down. I'll read it to you. Look it up later. But it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. He says, What I teach you, teach diligently. I think that the purpose of teaching and training is to teach to the preemptive of questions. Now, certainly questions are welcome and questions are needed at times, but I think that the whole point here is teach your children what I've told you to do and teach them diligently. Don't just expect them, well, Daddy, why do we have the phylacteries? Daddy, don't just expect them to understand why the robes at the hem have blue on them. Don't just expect them to understand that, well, it's, it's time to take a sacrifice to the, to, the, to, the, to the temple or to the tabernacle as it would be first. Don't just expect them to understand these things. No, teach them what I've told you to do. Don't just expect them to understand your actions because they need to be taught. Joshua chapter 4, as Joshua is leading the children of Israel uh, through the Jordan, and God tells them to grab 12 big stones, doesn't he? And he tells, tells them, take them with you to the place that I tell you to stop, which would be Gilgal. And it, it says this in Joshua chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. And Joshua said unto them, pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan and take up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. And this say, this that this may be a sign among you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, 
that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and it passed. And when it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and the stone shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Teach your children of the wonderful things God has done for you. There ought to be some memorials in your life of the victories God has given you. There should be some things in your life that when your children ask you, why, why do you do this? I've noticed, or perhaps even in the process of your life since they've been born, why don't you do this anymore? Or why don't we do this anymore? It's because God has given us the answer and the victory as to why we shouldn't do them anymore. Teach them. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way that he should go. Train, not just expect them to understand. Ephesians 6, verse 4, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to the wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Listen to me here this morning. If you just expect others to understand why you do things, don't be surprised when they don't. The world doesn't understand why we do things, and they ask questions. Brother Zada gave the testimony here this morning. and Again, he gave the testimony. If you were here, if you were listening online, you heard the testimony of how uh, when he was lost, when he was working, there was a, the, he went to a bar and he drank a beer at lunchtime every day. Now, I'm not trying to pick on Brother Zada. He gave that testimony of himself this morning. But there came a time when he stopped doing that. There, there came a time when God gave him victory over that. And I'm sure that raised some questions for some people. And it was an opportunity to teach why. Because they didn't understand. If you're going to live your life, or you're going to try to live, your, live God's will out in, in your life, your way, don't be surprised when people don't understand if you're not going to explain why you're doing something. Don't be surprised when you address issues in the wrong attitude. Don't be surprised when you address issues at the wrong time. Remember, if we're not doing it God's way, we're not going to be on time. We're either going to be too early or we're going to be too late. For Moses, he addressed the issue too early, ahead of God's time. We can also try to address issues too late as well, as I've already said. But, you know, it, it breaks my heart. Listen to me. and I, 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 It breaks my heart to watch and have people come to my office and say, Pastor, I don't know what to do about this with my children. And what usually happens is they're trying to address issues too late. Many, several years ago, not many years ago, but several years ago when my wife and I were still downstairs in the, in the youth department, uh, we had a, a, a young lady come in and a family come in, and this young lady, you know, she was wanting to be at church, and so she told her family she wanted to be at church, and so the family came to church. What happened there? The little girl was telling, their, telling the parents what she wanted to do, and they were doing it. Now, they should have been in church, but that little girl soon got out of the desire of wanting to come to church. You remember that, Mrs. Crump, don't you? And soon that little girl, she, she didn't want to come to church anymore because, you know what, the consequences of her sin, the reason why she wanted to come to church was because she was in some sinful activity, and as a result of her sinful activity, she was afraid, and she wanted God to not bring the consequences that she was afraid of. And then once those consequences kind of fell off, she no longer wanted to come to church, and she soon got right back involved with the same activities that she got in trouble with to begin with. As an underage girl began dating a college student, and as we went to that family and they stopped showing up to church, they stopped answering our phone calls, they wouldn't respond to text messages, and we stopped by the house and they reluctantly opened the door for us. We said, what's going on, mom and dad, because the teenage girl wouldn't come out and visit with us. You know what they said? Well, you know, she, she doesn't want to come to church anymore. She's found a, a boyfriend and he's in college. And, 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 you know, they're being intimate and they're being physical together. And, you know, we, we figured as long as they're safe, 
Can I tell you what happened? They didn't teach. And because they didn't teach, you know what happened? The child ran the show. And when mom and dad tried to, if we want to put it like this, crack the whip, <laughs> it didn't work. Don't be surprised if you're going to try to live God's will your way when the opportunity to have addressed issues before they became big problems passes you by. Are you with me? I'm not trying to be mean-spirited here, but it's there for us. Don't be surprised if your sin, listen, if you're going to live God's will your way, don't be surprised if your sin is what other people see and not your intentions. Because that's exactly what happened here with Moses and these two men, specifically the one that was in the wrong. They looked at Moses and they said, who are you? You're not, who made you a judge or a prince and a judge over us? You're a murderer. Are you going to smite us as you did the Egyptian? Now again, Moses did what he did for a reason, but it ended up being misinterpreted. You may do something, listen, you may do something that is intended one way. It was intended to show love. It was intended to show protection. It was intended to show care. It was intended to show that you're taking a stand for truth. But you did it the wrong way or at the wrong time, and it was misinterpreted, and all they see is wrong. Your sin. If you do it right... If you do it according to God's way and you do it in God's timing and with God's method and they choose to reject it, then that's on them. Praise the Lord for that. You may be doing something to try to try to unite your family, your church, your workplace, but if you do it in your own strength, your own wisdom, with your own methods, it's not going to bring about the purpose that you desire most of the time. If you're going to try and do God's will your way, don't be surprised when it fails. Now, let's deal with verse 13 and 14 a little bit further. Again, I told you there's too much here just to pass over. This is good stuff. This is practical stuff for us here today. Remember, Moses is a sinner. Amen to that. He murdered an Egyptian. He's trying to do God's will outside of God's timing without God's method, and it creates a big mess for him. But what Moses told these men was right. Moses was right about this, wasn't he? He said, you all are brethren. You shouldn't treat one another like this. You shouldn't, the man that was wrong, he said, you don't need to be smiting your brother. He points out the error to the one who did the wrong. And because there, obviously there's some type of dispute that came to blows. And in Acts chapter 7, verse 27, we're not going to turn there again, but the Bible tells us that as Moses told that person, the, told that person who was in error that he was wrong, he thrust Moses away from him. He pushes him. He gets in his face. He thrusts him away. And then he challenges Moses. Who made you a prince and a judge over us. And then he casts Moses' mistake back in his face. Isn't it amazing how people will justify their sin when they're in the wrong? Isn't it amazing by, that they will do that by pointing out the sin of others to try to justify themselves? Again, Moses did, did not do that which was right with the Egyptian but he was right about the current situation. Moses, in all actuality, according to societal norms at this time, he was an authority over this man. Remember, he was raised in Pharaoh's house. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, was he not? When he fled from Egypt, he was dressed like an Egyptian, not an Israelite which means he was probably dressed with the robes of one who was in Pharaoh's courts. I hope you're catching on what I'm trying to show you here. He looked like an authority figure. So why didn't they accept him as an authority? Because they had dirt on him. Does that make sense? 
What he did was right. His authority really was there. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter to society there. He was dressed as if he had just come from the palace more than likely. And they still rejected his authority because they knew some dirt on him or had some dirt on him. They knew he had killed this Egyptian man. What this man should have done is received the counsel and rebuke. He was wrong. The Bible says that he was wrong in verse number 13. And he said unto him that did the wrong. Over here in Acts chapter number 7, it says this in verse number 27. And he that did his neighbor wrong. Moses wrote Exodus 2. But he was still inspired of God to write it that this man was wrong. And then God gives us the commentary on Exodus 2 and Acts chapter 7. And God still says that the man that Moses addressed was what? Wrong. Stick with me here. This is so good. Stick with me. This is awesome. I hope you'll catch this. If for no other reason, this man should have accepted what Moses said because of Moses' position in society. This, uh, even if Moses didn't have any authority. This man was proud and was still wrong. And he needed to accept the rebuke. It reminds me of children who are doing things together. And they're doing things together, and then as soon as they leave the eyesight or the area where an authority figure is, they begin doing that which is wrong. One of them might do the wrong or start doing the wrong, and then the other one might say, I don't think that's right. I think we need to stop. And the one that's doing the wrong says, well, who made you boss? Or says who? Right? None of us have ever experienced that in our lives. None of us, I know. None of us ever did that in our lives, I'm sure. Can I, can I just help you here this morning? A good friend... Are you listening? A good friend will not allow a friend to go unwarned into wrong action. A good friend will not only warn, but will refuse to participate in wrong action. A good friend will not allow the fact that they are sinners, they might be a peer, they will not allow the fact that they may have made the same mistake in the past, but have learned from it and repented of it. Listen, you will not allow the fact that you are nothing more than just a sinner saved by grace keep you silent. A good friend won't. Simply because we are all sinners is no excuse or validation for our sin. Simply because we know of the sins of others does not warrant the rejection of biblical and wise counsel. Young people, just because your parents make mistakes does not warrant yours. I think that's good. <laughs> just because your parents have sinned and made mistakes does not justify you throwing off their authority. Just because you know of or have experienced the mistakes of your parents never justifies you throwing their sin in their face. Can I just say it like this in love to you this morning? I, I, don't, I hope this isn't going on, but can I say this to you in love this morning? If you're doing that, that is ungodly and wicked and is of the spirit of the devil. Doing this is breaking the commandment of God on your life. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. If this is happening, if this has been done, then you need to confess, repent, and ask God's forgiveness, and then you need to go to your parents, and you need to beg their forgiveness as well. That's what needs to happen. Because if that is happening, it is ungodly, and it is wicked. Well, they made mistakes. That doesn't excuse your mistake. You don't understand what they did. It doesn't excuse what you may do. Amen to that. 
Parents, if your children are doing this, could it be, could it be because you've been trying to do God's will your own way? Have you been trying to be a husband and father your own way? Have you been trying to be a wife and a mother your own way? You may need to sit down with the family and ask forgiveness. You may need to sit down and explain why you have done something instead of just thinking they'll understand why you've done something. You may need to sit down and explain why things need to change and how they will change according to the Bible. You may have known the promises of God. You may have seen the danger of bondage. You may have seen how to have deliverance from bondage. But if you did it the wrong way, in your own way, or in the wrong time, it should not come as a surprise if it failed. Are we together here this morning? But can I also encourage you with this, parents? <clears throat> Don't let past failures prevent you from leading as God tells you to lead. You messed up. You mess up. That's not anything to hide from or to ignore. If it's going to be something that you're going to try to get victory over, and if it's going to be something that's going to move the family forward, it needs to be addressed and move on. Can I also say this? Never apologize for leading God's way. Church family, if someone loves you to warn you or correct you, don't justify your sin with the fact that all of us are sinners. I hear that a lot. Well, all of us are sinners, preacher. Well, yeah, thank you. I didn't understand that. I'm so glad that you were there today to teach me that lesson biblically. Well, we're all human. Yes, I understand that. But if I love you enough to try to warn you or to try to help you with the situation in your life, don't throw up the fact that we're all sinners. Yeah, we all know that. Don't throw someone else's sin or failures in their face to justify yours. We are here to help one another, encourage one another. Hebrews 10, verses 23 through 25 tells us this, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. We're supposed to be provoking one another. We're supposed to be exhorting one another. We're supposed to be admonishing one another. We're supposed to be there for each other. And can I tell you here this morning, perhaps one of the greatest failures of Christendom, especially perhaps in the Baptist circle, is the fact that so many of us get together and we don't love on one another the way that we should. We don't invest in one another the way that we should. We don't talk about the things that are troubling us because if we talk about them, then people are going to know that we are sinners. But we're supposed to provoke one another. We're supposed to ask for help. And can I say it like this? We should be the people that we ought to be able to turn to for help. Amen to that. I'm having a good time here. This is so needed for us today. We're supposed to be a church family. I say this and I don't I say this and so you can take it for what it's worth but understand my heart behind it if you grew up in any family that was worth its salt your parents didn't let you just do whatever they wanted what you wanted to do No they loved on you and they warned you and they corrected you and they helped you and they encouraged you and they disciplined you and hey if we're going to be a church family we need to be doing those things for each other I know COVID is weird right now. I, I know that there's some, uh, some hindrances to fellowship, but there should not be a hindrance to love. Have we grown so accustomed to each other that we can just come in and sit down and not care what's going on in each other's lives? Or do we know when we just don't care? Yeah, I, I understand my heart when I say that. 
I love this church, and I think that this is a very friendly church, but perhaps, if nothing else, this is preventative preaching. Hey, we need to start talking to each other again. I have to stay six feet apart from you. That's all right. You can still talk from six feet apart. You know, words go farther than six feet. <laughs> We're supposed to be there for each other. Love on one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 and 15 says this, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Moses got ahead of God. He tried to do God's will his way. And he's going to spend the next 40 years in the wilderness. If you're going to get ahead of God's plan, if you're going to try to do God's will in your life, your way, don't be surprised. Listen, don't be surprised if it takes you longer to get to where you know you should have been than what it should have taken. But praise God, He still has a desire to use us. I serve the God of second, third, fourth, and fiftieth chances. I hope you caught that big jump there. He still loves us. Hey, Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years. And after that time period of what, whatever God was accomplishing in Egypt and Israel and in Moses in those 40 years, when it was time, God said, now I'll use you. Now you'll be my hand of deliverance. Praise God for His ability to still use after we make a mess. I don't want to end without getting through this, and I don't want to rush through it either. Would you bear with me for the next few moments, please? How is it then possible for me to do God's will His way? Would you turn with me to Colossians 1? Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians chapter, uh, excuse me, Colossians chapter 3. I knew I was off on that. Colossians chapter number 3. Forgive me. Colossians 3. Pastor, how is it that I'm going to accomplish God's will in my life His way? Colossians 3 verse 1, very quickly. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Pastor, how am I going to do this? If you're saved, is Christ first. Are you seeking Him first? Are you seeking those things that He would have you to seek instead of the things that you would be seeking? Look at verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Put to death your flesh. Look at verse number 8. But now ye also put off all these. Listen, you're putting off. You're putting off. Look again in verse number 9. Uh, uh, lie not to one another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. If you're going to do it God's way, you need to put off and you need to put on. If you're going to do it God's way, you can't put off or put on until you be renewed in your mind. Well, how do I be get renewed in my mind, Pastor? Look at verse number 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. So how is it, Pastor, that I do God's will His way? Can I ask you this? How's your relationship with God doing lately? How's your prayer life? How's your, how's your devotional life? Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's talking about that it becomes your way of thinking. Can I tell you the Word of God is not going to become your way of thinking unless you're in it? It's not going to become your way of thinking unless you're meditating on it, memorizing it, letting God speak to you. We all know Joshua 1.8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, 
but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Can I tell you, I cannot, I cannot overemphasize the importance of the Word of God to your life. If I could walk along with you every single moment of your day and in every situation that every conversation you have thump you upside the head with the Bible and say, what would God say that you should say about that? It would not be an overemphasis of the importance of the Word of God in your life if I could do that every moment of the day throughout your day. These verses are stressing how we're going to do God's will His way. Your devotional walk is vital. You have to commune with God and fellowship with Him. That is the key to maintaining the spiritual walk in your life, communion with God. It's not volition. It's not just the will. It's communion. But you must volitionally choose to have communion. The communion with God, your devotional life, is what maintains the Spirit of God in your life. Communion keeps grace on the throne, reigning in your life, and not sin. You remember we read Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21 there? Sin reigns unto death, but grace through righteousness reigns unto life everlasting. Your relationship with God is what's going to keep God on the throne of your life and you off of it. When we stop having our communion and relationship with God, that's when we fall short of God's leadership and power and direction for our lives. If we will commune with God, He will commune with us. Listen, I, I, I wish you could catch my heart on this. I wish, I wish that you would allow this to revolutionize your life. I wish you would. Because if you would, all your problems that seem so large, all of these, if you would allow the Word of God to change your life and to humble yourself to His leadership in your life, guess what? You'd get along with your parents. You'd get along with your children. You'd get along with your co-workers. You'd get along with your church family. If we will commune with Him, He will direct us. After that, we have to surrender ourselves to His Word and will and actively pursue change. I hope you'll catch this because I'm going to repeat this again tonight, this thought here. We have to actively pursue change. The problem most believers have is, when they are, is that they are taking a passive approach to their Christian life. I'm saved. Why doesn't everything change? Why would anything change if you're not changing your actions? Why would anything change if you're not changing what God tells you to change? Can I tell you, just because you got saved doesn't make ungodly decisions and ungodly lifestyles now godly. Simple, but oh man, that's, that's good. Most Christians think that they're saved. Now that they're saved, everything will begin to change. That's not true. Most Christians are waiting for God to make some miraculous change in them as if it will just occur without their involvement. Remember, God's a gentleman. He will never force you to do anything you don't want to do. Or they're waiting for the pastor to just preach that one message that will actually change them. But are you actively pursuing a devotional life with God? And as you pursue that, that personal devotional life with God, God will reveal to you what He wants you to change, and then you must actively pursue the change. Unfortunately, some are not interested in personal change. They want everyone else to change. If everybody else were just less annoying, I'd be a better Christian. 
If everybody else were a better driver, I wouldn't have the problem with my temper. No, God wants you to change. If you're going to try to live God's will for your life, your way, it should be no surprise when it doesn't work. But if we will actively pursue that relationship with God, listen to me, if you'll actively pursue it, you don't get better. Danny, you're in karate, right? Did you get better overnight? The first time you put on your, your karate uniform, were you just like, ah, I'm a karate expert? You had to work, didn't you? How many belts did you go through to get to your black belt? Eight. Which means they tested you, right? At every belt. Now Danny's a black belt. Don't mess with Danny. Danny's a dangerous man. He didn't become good overnight. You're not going to become a better Christian just because I'm saved. No, you're going to become a better Christian by actively practicing what God tells you to do. Danny's punches. Danny's throws. Danny's kicks. I'm sure they're good. Well, maybe. I'm sure they are. But they didn't get there just because they showed him once. No, he had to actively pursue it then. He had to improve it. He had to perfect it. To the teacher's satisfaction. The same for the Christian life. That's how you're going to fulfill God's will for your life his way. Let's pray this morning. Father, I come before you today and I thank you for the opportunity to have preached this message. Father, many times I know in my own life I've lived your will my way and have become frustrated, frustrated others, missed opportunities, other people misunderstood. Lord, I thank you for your grace and still your desire to still use me and to even correct some of the mistakes that I made when I tried to do your will my own way. Father, this was a message I believe that each and every one of us needs, and I thank you for the right timing in the passage. Just, uh, just what we needed today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to live your will your way. Help us to commit to that personal walk with God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Crump from Lighthouse Baptist Church in Holbrook, Massachusetts. Thank you for tuning in with us today. We pray that you are blessed as you were a blessing to us. We want to help every person who may not know that heaven is their home to know that for sure today. The Bible teaches us that you may know that you have eternal life in 1 John 5.13. It's something that you can rest assured about tonight as you lay your head upon your pillow that heaven is your home. To know that for sure, you must first accept and admit your condition before God. Romans 3.10 teaches us, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That means before God, no person is perfect. I'm not perfect, and if you're honest with yourself, you're not perfect either. The reason why we're not perfect is found in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The reason I'm not perfect, the reason why you're not perfect, is because of sin. And our sin causes us to fall short of God's standard of perfection. That's the standard God says that we need to meet by ourselves in order to get into heaven. Perfection. But sin, in all the varied ways that it can come out in our lives, keeps us from meeting God's standard. Therefore, because we fail to meet God's standard, our payment for this is death. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Not only physical death, but most importantly, spiritual death, as defined in Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15, and Revelation 21, verse number 8. But God does not want us to have to experience that payment. That's why Romans 5, 8 says, but God, 
commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his love for me and for you and for the whole world in sending Jesus Christ to die in your and my place to pay the death penalty that was upon us. That's how much God loves you. He sent his only begotten son to die in your and my place. And as a result of that, Romans 6, 23 continues to say, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus Christ, when he died for us and shed his blood for us, and when he arose again, he gives us the opportunity to have eternal life as a free gift offered by God through his actions on our behalf. And how we accept that free gift is reaching out by faith to accept it. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The way that we have the gift of eternal life is by admitting our condition before God and confessing to God that we cannot get ourselves to heaven, but it's only through Jesus Christ. Therefore, you would just reach out by faith in a simple prayer of faith. God, I know I'm a sinner, and I know that I cannot get to heaven by myself. But in your love, you sent Jesus Christ to die for my sin. And I want to accept the free gift that you offer to me by Jesus Christ. I understand that he's the only way I can get to heaven, and I accept that for the forgiveness of my sins that I may have heaven as my home. The Bible teaches us that if you would say a simple prayer like that in faith of what God said and what Jesus did, you can be saved today. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can know heaven is your home today by what Jesus did and what God says. If you would make that decision by faith today, God will save you. We'd love to hear about your decision. If you make that decision, contact us. We'd love to hear about it. If you're looking for a church home near you, please let us know. We'd love to be able to help you find a good Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Thank you again for tuning in, and we pray to see you again soon. God bless.